I'd like to read in the Old Testament. We're going to leave Paul for a moment. And I'd like to read in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, Referenced already, um, just for the sake of those who may have anxiety at this moment, if you find the book of Psalms, go backwards, Job, Esther, Nehemiah. Nehemiah, and we will read in chapter number 8, one of the better known chapters in this book, along with chapter 1 maybe, with the prayers again already mentioned. Nehemiah chapter number 8, and just before we read, I want you to keep a question in mind. Um, This is really my burden for this session, and I felt really, uh, I struggled over it because here you are, it's your 79th. Uh, Bible conference here in Midland Park, and many of you have attended conferences, and yet my burden is just to reestablish what is the main purpose for a Bible conference. In other words, why are we here? Now, the reason this has come into my mind is COVID-19 put a pause on in-person conferences, and here we are, at least one of the initial ones, if I'm not probably the first one out here in the on the east side. But why? Why are we here? What are we here to do? In a sense, I wish this would almost have been at the outset, but hopefully may the Lord help it to motivate in the coming sessions with our brethren and what they will take up. But why do we come? I mean, tremendous expense to the assembly here, to book the school, the meals. You all have committed a weekend of your time, some of you in busy college and high school setting. For what purpose? Why do we come? And I'd like to take this from Nehemiah chapter 8. If it's basic, that's all right. Nehemiah 8 and verse number 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood Mattathiah and Shema and Aniah and Urijah and Hilkiah and Messiah, on his right hand and on his left hand, Padiah, Mishael, Malchiah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Mashulam. You'll have a quiz on that at the end of the weekend. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua and Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodijah, Messiah, Kalida, Azariah, Jazabad, Hanan, Haliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book and the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the Tirshatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said it unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet. Send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to, great, and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. And on the second day, day two of the conference here, and on the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. You notice that specified there. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths, and the feast of the seventh month, and that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mount, and fetch olive branches, and pine branches, and myrtle branches, and palm branches, and branches of thick trees, to make booths, as it is written. 
So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, every one upon the roof of his house and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the street of the water gate and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. And all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths, sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, unto that day, had not the children of Israel done so. And there was very great gladness. Also day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read in the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day was a solemn assembly, according unto the manner. One thing that might just tie our three messages together is the word joy. Nehemiah 8 is where we find, I suppose, the coffee mug verse, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And yet the context is what we'll be looking at today. Joy mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 5, joy in Philippians. And here, what we're going to talk about is the secret to a joyful conference. Because it began with them having joy when they understood the words, and at the end of the passage, when they obeyed it, it says there was very great joy rejoicing when they put it into practice, the secret of a joyful conference. Now back to my question. What is the purpose of a Bible conference? I could ask my brothers here. I could ask the overseers. But what I would like to do is ask the rest of us. If you were to just write out Nehemiah chapter 8, do you know what you would continually write out? All the people. All the people. Eleven times you would continually be writing, all the people. You say, how many people? Well, slightly more than are here today. About 40,000 people. 40,000 people gather together as one man. What does that mean? With one purpose. One desire. One aim. What was their aim? What did they want? Why did they have this conference? What was their goal? What's your goal? Why have you come? You say, it's great to be together. Now listen, you're not going to hear me knocking any of the secondary goals. Great to meet people. Great to have meals together and fellowship. And just, I hope this is the end of Zoom conferences. I mean, it would be just great if it's just in person from here out. But all of these things are secondary. And you and I may differ on what we put as number two. We should not differ as what we put as number one. What is the main reason you have come? What is the main reason I have come? And before you answer, let me ask these people. Why have they come? 40,000 people gathered together as one man. For what? Bring the book. Bring the book. That was their call to the preacher that day. They were not interested in entertainment. We've heard about that already. They were not interested in jokes, stories. Their conference time was not a fashion show. Bring the book. One single shared desire among about 40,000 people. Is that your desire? Somehow in the quietness of your morning or even leading up to this, have you desired, I will come beyond Mr. Usher, Mr. Higgins? Oh God, speak to me. Bring me the book. I'm in need of direction. I have perplexing problems in my life. Bring the book. This was their longing. Their longing for the book. The background of this uh, book just to get us up to chapter 8, Nehemiah, you've already heard, he had a great concern. Good, had a good job there in the palace. Great concern. He moved from his concern. In chapter 2, it becomes a conviction. He, he has to go. And then from chapter 3 to chapter 7, he's involved in construction. He's building these walls. And then there's conflict with different people who are throwing stones and stopping the work, but he keeps going. And in here in chapter 8, here's the conference. And over and over you'll find in chapter 8, the book. Five times. Probably as far as references to the Word of God, 
You could, if you include the book, the law, the words, what's written, probably 19 times. The emphasis in a conference on what? This book. This book. And if this just, again, serves to further or create anticipation for the afternoon session and the sessions tomorrow, may the Lord grant that that would be the case, because I hope we can come with this desire. Great to see each other. Great to see all of you. Some of you haven't seen you in, in quite a while. But there's one purpose. Bring that book. Bring us that book. They're longing. All the people. Again, this is uh, slightly different than what Mr. Usher is bringing before us in unity. But tied in in this way, if we want unity, we will only get it from this book. You know, you and I, if we had a conversation at lunchtime, will differ on a lot of things. But I hope when it comes to why we come to a Bible conference. I hope we will all agree. We come to hear from that book. The men are very replaceable. The book isn't. The pulpit is not a platform for the big man. The pulpit is the platform for the big book. It's about the book. And I feel, and again, I'm not out here on the East Coast enough to pass any kind of a thing for you all, but I feel if I speak from where I'm at and some of the conferences I've been to, we've lost sight of the main thing. We come and we don't have that longing for this book. Now I want you to know this, that these people, this has touched me very much, this was not some special, pious, super spiritual people who wake up in the morning and just love the book. Because if that was the case, sorry, there wouldn't be hope for most of us. These people had gone on a big journey to get to this place where they just wanted the book. These people had come out of Egypt, great signs and wonders. God had led them. God had given them His law. They had moved through that place and and God had said, my word will be enough. You follow it, blessing. You don't follow it, cursing. And over and over, do you know what they did? We don't want that book. Give us a king. Give us the food of Egypt. Take us back to, to what everyone else has. It says in the book of Jeremiah chapter 11 that the Lord had told them, obey my voice. Yet, they obeyed not. They didn't even incline. They didn't even bend their ear to hear the book. They walked every one of them, in the imagination of their evil heart. This was a people leading up to this time that had no time for the book. They did not desire it. I'm speaking generally now. Not that there weren't the exceptions here and there. Sure, there was the Samuel. And then you had Saul, David, Solomon. But from that point on, maybe this will help you. Nehemiah, I know it comes before the book of Psalms. Nehemiah is basically towards the end of your Old Testament. This, could, this book could be put right before the book of Malachi, chronologically. This is way after Jeremiah, Isaiah. This is almost the end of the Old Testament. The people, what had happened? They had ignored the book. They had settled for other things. We don't need the book. We have our way of living. We have our things that we would like to do. And God continually brought before them prophets and speakers, and they continually rejected the book until eventually what happens to them? They're put into captivity. Very difficult chastening they endured. The loss of life. Very painful chastening. And how oh, it touches me. Here's a people. Their history was not one of great spirituality. No. Their history was one of great carnality. But here they are. They all gather together. They say, we don't need the sideshows anymore. We don't need a king. We don't need the Egyptian food. Bring the book. Bring the book. You know what you'll notice in Nehemiah 8? It wasn't the elders who called the conference. It wasn't the preacher. The people gathered. Bring us that book. Why? Because they knew the reason why they were in such a place 
where there wasn't blessing that God had promised is because they had deviated from that book. You know, I think it would be good for us just to, again, be impressed in our hearts. I know we, uh, I know, we know this confessionally. I know it's on our websites. But we have nothing else but the book. We have nothing else. This book is all we have. And the Spirit of God to teach us from it. Sola Scriptura. If you, want to, if you want an expression from your history. All we have is the Bible. And so they're longing for the book. It's at this uh, <clears throat> first day of the seventh month. That's the uh, Feast of Trumpets, if you compare. This was the time when the book would have been brought. Feast of Trumpets this year fell on September the 6th, I think, or September the 7th. And so just in this season, I suppose, in the September season, people are gathering together for the book, longing for it. Why? I think the reason they longed for it is because they had tasted the barrenness of everything else. They knew nothing else would do. They had tried the other things. Remember, this is a long history. And I can tell you from my own very limited experience, nothing else will do. Not for a conference. You know, the people who have been any benefit ultimately in my life, yes, I've appreciated the people who throw a joke in so I don't go to sleep. You don't get bonus points for people going to sleep, you know, and more people eating more candy. But the conferences I remember are the ones where people brought me the book. Never forget it. Never forget when the book was opened. For the first time I understood. Thou God seest me. That's not a... That's not a verse that I thought, well, in Sunday school, it's just conviction. No, the woman there running out in the middle of the desert. God saw her. He saw her. The God of all eternity. When the most godly spiritual couple had no time for her, God saw her. And when a man opened that up for the... He brought me the book. I never forgot that. Never forgot that. And thank God for the people who can do that. And a longing for this book. And that's what I think opened up for the rest of the conference. Because they had this expectation, because they longed for the book, then what follows is they listened to the book. Then they learned from the book. And then they lived out the book. All of it, why? All of it like a three-pronged fork from this. All we want is the book. And I have found, at least in my own experience, I know the Lord can awake you up and shake you up. But I have found when you come to a conference with expectation, anticipation, then the Word of God, your heart is soft enough for the Word of God to to speak to you. The longing for the book. I just want to leave it as a challenge to you. Would that be all right from this conference? Is that number one priority? Bring us the book. Mr. Usher, Bring us Philippians. We need that. Mr. Higgins, bring us the book. Is that your longing? You see, there's problems in our lives that can only be solved by this book. Experiences of men, the life they've lived, grain of salt. But this book is sufficient. Then they listened. They listened, how do they listen? Well, they listened, we already mentioned, expectantly. They listened attentively, verse 3. The ears of all the people were attentive. I think the Hebrew expression literally means they were bent forward. The ears of all the people bent forward, listening to the book. We want to know what God is saying. Ezra, you're you're the speaker chosen for the simple reason you know the book. That's it. Because we want to know what the book has to say and how it applies to our lives. And they're bending forward, ears bent, attentive, listening. Again, just underlining what was already mentioned. No passive listening. That's no way to listen. All of these things I think we emphasize in the gospel, right? The Word of God. Listen. Understand what He has to say. But we kind of take a side way and forget about that when we become Christians. The same thing. We listen attentive. They listened reverently. You notice that when Nehemiah opens the book in the sight of all the people, and he prays to the great God. The end of the captivity. Oh, sorry, Ezra. Ezra prays to the great God. 
And all the people, it says, they bowed their heads. They said, amen, amen, with their faces to the ground, their faces in the dirt, right? The reverence. Before Ezra? No. The reverence under the book. I don't want to sound like a crank. I'm the furthest thing from one. But my generation is a very irreverent generation. I'm 29, so that includes you in your 30s and everyone else <laughs> beneath that. You know, if we want to actually hear from God at this conference, I'm not talking about special clothing that makes you reverent. I'm talking about the heart's repentant attitude. We need that book. And when that book speaks, God speaks. Do you believe that? That when Scripture speaks, God speaks? I think that's what the Bible teaches. Now, scripture has to be applied and spoken faithfully. But when Scripture speaks, God speaks. And so they did not listen flippantly. They did not listen Facebook in one hand, Instagram in one hand. No. They were all gathered to hear from one book expectantly, reverently, attentively. Why were they reverent? Because God was speaking. Listening under the book. And God does bless such unified purpose and listening because then they learn from the book. You see, the job of Ezra was just to stand up, read the book, and then there were a whole bunch of men, 13 men, who would explain it. His job was not to pound a pulpit, nothing wrong with doing that, but his job was not to do that. His job was not to be the greatest public speaker in the area. His job was to open the book and explain it in such a way that people understood what the book was saying, what God is saying. And again, this is what Paul applies in 1 Corinthians 14. I would rather speak five words with their understanding. Understanding, edification. These are the aims from my standpoint up here for a conference. My aim today is that you would understand Nehemiah chapter 8. And if that happens, I have done my job. It is not my aim to fascinate you or entertain you. If it was, I would decline the invitation because I can't do that. But it's just to explain the book. And the people are listening to learn. What does it mean? And that's what we need. Hey, we need people who know how to explain the Word of God. Exposit, if you want to call it. We need all kinds. People who can take one verse and exhort the Christians. People who can take a letter and open up the letter in such a way that we understand what that letter is about. People who can draw the links between the Old and New Testament in a world that says we can just be unhitched from that. No, we can't. It's all we have. These, these two volumes. These two testaments. We need it all, brothers and sisters. We need the book. And so they learned. When they learned, it says they wept. Because uh, I think they wept because they had not followed what was in the book. They learned that they had been disobedient. I haven't spoken enough in teaching. Maybe I could ask my brethren here. When's the last time a message was given and the people started to weep? When's the last time the people of God were repentant under his book? We've departed. We've gone our own way. We've settled. That's what they did. So much so, I had to call one of the elders, Nehemiah. And he and Ezra and the others, stop weeping. Stop weeping. This is a day of rejoicing. That's where it comes in. The joy of the Lord is your strength. This is a day of feasting. Don't weep. But uh, that's what happened when they understood. I should just say this. My purpose in uh, taking up Nehemiah chapter 8 is to look at it from the audience's perspective. What all the people wanted and then what happened to them. A lot could be said. From Nehemiah's perspective, a lot could be said from Ezra's perspective. I have 
no moral authority to cover those two. But I will say this. Isn't it good? When all the people wanted the book, that there was a man who knew the book. I may get in trouble for saying this. Do you, do you all know that my two brothers here go affectionately by the term of grandpa? Do you know that? There are certain people who call them grandpa. If the desire of local assemblies in, in North America is to bring the book, who's going to bring it? Who's going to bring the book? Young men, just because this is talking about public teaching here, will already learn that it's not just for men. And, you know, it's great when a man is prepared for the occasion and when the occasion is prepared for the man. Here's an occasion prepared. The people are thirsting. They're longing. Nothing else but the book. Well, great. There's a man who's been spending 14 years studying nothing less but the book. Just studying it, pouring over the words, understanding it, and he can bring it to the people. And so they learned. A long conference. It lasted from the morning to the midday. And then after they had learned, they went and had lunch, which is what we'll be doing very soon. So, uh, Then they came the second day. I'll just close with this in the few minutes that are left. They longed for the book. Give us the book. Bring us the book. Then they listened expectantly, attentively, reverently to God speak through his book. Then they learned, oh, that's what God is saying. And then they went out and lived the book. Not lived the convictions of a preacher, not adopted his stances, lived the book, lived out the teaching of the book. They came back and now they're even more expectant. They don't just want to hear from the book, they want to hear the details. You notice that in verse number 13. They came, just a few of them now, the chief, the, the leaders came to understand the words. They want to hear specifically the words from the law. And what they find is that during this feast day, of the Feast of Trumpets, there was something very specific that was supposed to happen. During the Feast of Trumpets, the people of Israel were supposed to live in booths, tents, temporary dwellings, and they were all living in houses. And it was something that seemed rather archaic. I mean, this hadn't been done since the days of Joshua. Now remember, we're at the end of the Old Testament. Keep that in mind. So that means no for Samuel, no for Saul, no for David, no for Solomon. We keep going. No for Asa. We're all the way at the end, and here's something that's supposed to be done. But you see, they were in such an expectancy for the Word of God, such an expectancy for the book. They didn't have all their clever ways of, that's metaphorical, or, or, or that might be just applied here. And there. No, God says we should do that. So you know what they did? Well, what we, said, what we took the labor to read, they went and cut down the trees and put it over their things and over their uh, dwellings. And they lived in the booths, reminding them that they were God's pilgrim people. God's pilgrim people just passing through. And they obeyed the book. I hope I'm not giving the, uh, I hope I'm not giving the vibe, I guess. I can't think of a better word. I hope I'm not giving that, that this is a kind of solemn and serious and awful conference. I mean, do you know what happened? When they understood the book and when they obeyed it, do you know what happened? There was very great rejoicing. The secret to a conference where there is very great rejoicing is obeying what we hear. Obeying the calls to having the attitude mentioned in the previous two messages. Obeying that. Not just writing it down, but putting it into practice. Living out the book. Because when you're living out the book, you're doing it only for the audience of one. You're doing it to please the Lord. And you have then the joy of the Lord as your strength. And these people went out and they obeyed the book, even though it hadn't been done for so long. You notice who obeyed it? Let me just point that out to you here. Verse 17. All the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity. Sometimes you can be cynical even as a speaker. You can think, well, I'll, I'll do my best and I trust the Lord will give help and maybe, maybe one young man. Right? 
You know, when God's at work, all the congregation, how many? It's on the back of your notes next to Philippians. 40,000 people. 40,000 people bowed to one book. Great joy. Revival. Great joy. Oh, that's my expectation. My expectation from the conference is that we would all come together. Maybe that hasn't been. Maybe that hasn't been your expectation. Maybe you came and said, I'm just excited. First in-person conference. I'm just excited to be back at in-person conferences. That's great. Me too. You know, maybe in the quietness of your lunch hour, maybe you can just lift the Nehemiah prayer to the Lord there and just say, Lord, you know the complexity of my life. You, you know all the fumbles I've taken in the last few months. Please bring me that book. And maybe to gather again this afternoon, expectant to hear from God. And then to obey. So, my burden is just that our conferences, see we're at the kind of outset again of this in-person conference. My burden is at conferences, the 79th this weekend, Lord willing, the 80th, and other conferences that will start up. That all the people, not just the elders, not just the speakers, all the people, you and I, would desire nothing else but the Word of God. That our desire when we come to a conference gathering would be, bring the book, the whole book, and nothing but the book.